talk that I lost track of the time for a little bit. Uh, by the way, in case I forgot to mention uh, earlier, we'll, we'll do, like most sessions, the Q&A at the end. So if you think of something, pricks your interest, make a little note, and we'll do it, uh, time permitting, at the end here. Uh, but uh, we won't let a few facts like he presented bother us uh, with this. Uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, who is going to wing it without the use of slides, so you can focus on his face. Uh, and uh, yes, well, such a such a poem, such a face. Uh, uh, what are you saying? Yes, J J James uh, Delingpole. Now, this was the interesting one. I should have him read his own uh, bio here, but uh, he's an author. I'm having trouble with the lighting up here. That's the problem here. Is is an author, broadcaster, and blogger who helped break the climate gate story in the United Kingdom on his rude, controversial, merciless, outspoken but sometimes mildly amusing, which he hope he is uh, this afternoon. Uh, rude, on the rude side, uh, Telegraph blog. He is right about everything. Actually, what I say with my kids, I'm always right, and they echo back, except when you're not. Uh, he's right about everything. He does not believe in man, bear, pig. He's gonna explain all that. He is the author of several uh, mightily entertaining books, including Welcome to Obama Land. I've seen your future and it doesn't work and a rip-roaring adventure series set in World War II featuring his aristocratic uh, part American hero, Dick Coward, the first of which is called Coward on the Beach. Welcome our next speaker. Thank you. Um, before I go on, may I just ask, how many people here, stick up your hands if you are in the pay of big oil? And how many, how many here would like to be in the pay of big oil? <laughs> I guess we picked the wrong side of the debate to be on, didn't we? <laughs> now, I want to tell you a story about something extraordinary that happened to me um, late last year. Um, it was an ordinary Thursday morning, and I was sitting at my desk, wondering which libtard to have a go up next on my blog. <laughs> and uh, into my lap fell the story that would change my life and quite possibly save Western civilization from the greatest threat it has ever known. <laughs> that story, can you guess what the story was called? Climate Gate, well guessed. Not Man Bear Pig, Climate Gate. Um, I wasn't the first person to use the word Climate Gate. Actually what happened was, I was reading um, the What's Up With That blog and I was looking at the comments below. And a commenter called Bulldust had said, I wonder how long it will be before somebody calls this story Climate Gate. <laughs> so I took his ball and I, so I was the second person to use the word Climate Gate. Um, and by the end of that week, my blog had had 1.5 million hits, which is like 1.4 million times more than I was used to. <laughs> um, the word climate gate, because I obviously one gets quite vain about these things, I googled it. By the end of that week, it had had 30 million Google hits. So this story had gone viral, which is a very exciting thing. It changed my life. Suddenly, I felt like I was Neo in the Matrix. I couldn't actually walk through walls or do cool martial arts move or anything like that. But what I could do was get invited onto panels like this with some of my, my climate heroes. I mean, look, Fred Singer, Joe DeLeo, Ross McKittrick. What an honor. I feel like a humble shepherd boy who has suddenly been translated to Mount Olympus. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> uh, it is true that I am not in these, I am not worthy. I'm also rather puzzled to be on a, on a panel which is marked Science. I am not a scientist. Uh, you may have worked this out already. Uh, I read, as, uh, as, as one of my arch enemies is fond of pointing out, you know, one, I, I've attracted several sort of warmists who really don't like me very much. I, I can't think why. Uh, and one of them keeps banging on about the fact that, that, that who is this guy? He got, a, he got an English degree from Oxford. What, who the hell does he think he is to be talking to us about um, climate change? Um, that's a very good question. Um, 
I want to panel about science, but it is my contention, and I don't wish to upset those of you who are scientists here, of which I believe there are rather many, and you, you could threaten me at this point. I don't think this debate is really about the science. I don't think it ever has been really about the science. I mean, it's nice, it's fantastic that the science is on our side and, and that we are right. But I think if there's one thing we learned, actually, well, we've learned several things, but one of the most important things we learned from the climate gate emails is that these scientists involved in the emails were not really that interested in science. I mean, traditionally, science has been about, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, science has been about the selfless pursuit of knowledge, about sharing data, about a kind of process of creative dis destruction whereby older, discredited theories are replaced by newer, more plausible ones. Science is about listening to dissenting voices with an open mind. Science is not a branch of public policy making. Now, I don't think, looking at the climate gate emails, that what we saw going on there was science, do you? Uh, now, interestingly enough, sorry, I'm drawing up here. Um, the day before, the day before the, by uncanny coincidence, the day before the climate gate story broke, I had been at the European Union at uh, a conference of evil climate change deniers, uh, some of whom are here with me today. Fred was there and Ross was there on the same panel. And rather excitingly, by mistake, I'd been called Dr. James Dellingfold, and I didn't bother correcting anyone, I didn't bother talking. <laughs> and at that um, particular conference, I came away feeling slightly dispirited. I felt like, yeah, we, we have all the science on our side, but I felt like we were lonely voices crying in the wilderness. We were saying lots of cool stuff and no one gave a damn. What Climate Date Gate did, I think, for a, for a while, rather excitingly, was to make people interested in stuff that in our community, we, we're all, I think we're all part of this community, aren't we? Uh, we took this stuff for granted. We known about, about this stuff for some time. We knew about the hockey stick and stuff. What Climate Debt Gate did was get at least a tiny portion of the, of the mainstream in, uh, media interested in what was going on in our world. Um, I'd like to be able to say, in that optimistic way, way that all you Americans have, that we were on the winning team still and things were going really going our way. I'm not sure whether that's the case. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing, I don't know whether you people are sensing at all, that there has been a slight lull since that initial excitement. I mean, in the first flush of Climate Gate, I wrote, this is our Berlin Wall moment. And that's how it felt for a time. But I'm sensing now that uh, the, uh, the enemy, I think that's what, what we should call them, um, the warmest, whatever, um, are entrenching their positions. They are, uh, rather than answer the scientific questions that we are posing to them. They are resorting to their old tactics of um, uh, the appeal to authority. You know, you've got organizations like the, the Royal Society, founded 1660, uh, motto nullius in verba, um, you know, take no one's word for it, has suddenly become taken over by, by war myths. Um, and they're not interested in the new science that keeps coming up. They're interested in, in guarding their entrenched positions. And this is why, although I feel uh, completely out of place here on Mount Olympus, uh, a mere <coughs> Oxford arts graduate among these great scientific experts, at the same time, I think that uh, evil people like me uh, people who are not afraid of taking the argument ad hominem occasionally and being a bit sort of naughty. I think we have a part to play in this war. And I use that word war quite deliberately because I think what we are fighting now is a war as important in its way as the wars of violence that our, our fathers and grandfathers fought in the First World War and the Second World War, 
Because ultimately, what we're fighting for is exactly the same thing. What we are fighting for is liberty. The war, the, the whole debate about AGW is not just about the battle for scientific truth. It is essentially a battle between two diametrically opposed views of the world. You look at the entire history of the global war warming movement from the junk science that was Rachel Carson's Silent Spring that killed millions of people by banning the drug that dealt with uh, malaria mosquitoes. Um, you look at the entire history of the global warming movement and what you realize that time and again it is the work not of scientists pursuing, pursuing truth but of activists who have a very particular view of the world. That view is essentially a view of the world which hates humanity, which sees mankind as a blot on the landscape. They are obsessed with the idea of overpopulation. They are also very much against capitalism in any form. They talk about the limits to growth, which was of course the title of the, the Club of Rome's 1970 bestseller, the one that inspired so many of these warmest today. Uh, they, want to, they want to end the capitalist system. They want, to, they want to bomb us back to the dark ages so that we're all living in yurts and traveling around by coracles and uh, you know, we don't have cars anymore and maybe we, we, horses might be allowed, but that's about it. Um, so they hate people, they hate uh, the Western economy, and they believe that uh, resources are scarce, we're, we're going to run out very soon, we must do something about it. And the only way of dealing with it is not as, as we've dealt with them in the past, by inventing new technologies, but by big government stepping in and telling us what to do and controlling our lives. Now, as I say, the AGW debate is about two diametrically opposed views of the world. One of them is the route that I prefer, which is the route of uh, celebrating human achievement, recognizing that, you know, we humans have done some pretty good, good shit in our time. Uh, <laughs> we've uh, painted the Sistine Chapel. Not me personally, but somebody did, uh, Michelangelo, I believe. We have written Shakespeare, uh, even Moliere, the French think he's quite good. I, I'm not so <laughs> convinced by that. Germans, Germans did Goethe. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, I mean, wasn't he cool? Didn't he do some cool stuff? We like him, Ronnie Reagan. You know, in all sorts of different, I, 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 I would mention sport, but I, I'm not very good at, uh, name, uh, Dale Earnhardt. Uh, uh, um, we have done some good stuff in our time, and I think we should celebrate that. You know, I like me. I like you. I think we should all be here. I think we should all be breeding, breeding as many children as we want to, not to have kind of state saying, not to have people like Jonathan Porritt saying, thou shalt have only one child, which is what these, you know, these dark greens are into. They're into population control. I think we should celebrate the fact that we're here and celebrate the fact that we all want to improve our lives economically. We, you know, I want to get richer. I don't want to be on the level I am. I want my kids to be even richer and happier and better educated, if that's possible, than I am. <laughs> um, against us, against our joyful view of the world, we have the forces of green darkness, represented by people like George Monbiot, James Hansen, the wicked toad creature, Al Gore. <laughs> I, we have right and justice on our side. I think we should um, fight for the right to be happy because I think happiness and liberty are things which are really worth, worth fighting for. Worth actually, uh, I mean I see this being a, um, a, an HEW evil denier thing. It, it's, it's, it's like a, a very expensive hobby for me. I mean, I'm doing it for the cause rather than for the money, let me tell you. And I, I, I'm sure it's the same for many of you. We are not funded very well. 
I reckon, I, I calculated on a bit of paper, I may be slightly awry, but I calculated that uh, the amount of money being spent by organizations like Greenpeace and uh, World Wildlife Fund and big government and so on, supporting the warmest cause, is about three and a half thousand times more than has been spent arguing our side of things. Now, I think that is a very unhealthy imbalance because, as I say, we represent the happy people, the people who are optimistic about the future. <laughs> yeah, good. It's good to be on the right side, isn't it? Um, a final point I wanted to make, um, which answers a question I kind of answered at the beginning, what am I doing here among these great scientists? I watched a rather interesting um, BBC documentary uh, about World War II, which is my other, other obsession apart from HEW. And um, it was a, a fascinating documentary about this, um, a black propaganda department that uh, Britain operated during the war. And they interviewed this very well-spoken uh, young, well, she wasn't young uh, by the time of the interview, she was in her, in her 80s, but obviously she'd been a, a young lady from a good family. And her responsibility, she'd, she'd been over, overseeing the art department, which was responsible for producing black propaganda. And one of, her, uh, one of the things she said about it was that when they drew pictures of... Um, they had to draw rude po postcards of Nazis in uncompromising uh, positions. <laughs> and one of her jobs was to make sure that when the, a certain part of the uh, Nazis' anatomy was drawn by the artist, that it was nice and small. <laughs> and I feel that my job in this propaganda war is to make sure that when we look at our goal, we think of... <laughs> um, thank you very much.